Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is a very fascinating one covering the Book of Mark in the New Testament. And this is lesson number 11 in that series for September 14 of 2024, entitled, Taken and Tried. I think you could probably have some information. If you know a little bit about the Gospel of Mark, you can figure out what that might be talking about. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, it's hard for us to even imagine what all you have been through to prepare the way for us to go home and live with you forever. May we take advantage of every possible uh, um, lesson that's available to us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In our study of the Gospel of Mark, we have come to the spring of AD 31, three and a half years after the anointing of Jesus at his baptism as the Son of God and the Savior of man, of men and women, I might add. We are in the middle of the 70th week of the prophecy recorded in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Like the other gospel writers, Mark took almost half of his book to discuss the last week of the life of Jesus. Jesus' death occurred on Friday, the day of Passover. In this lesson, we will review three major events occurring on Thursday and Friday of what has come to be called Passion Week. Those three major events we will discuss are one, the feast at Simon's house with Mary anointing Jesus' feet and head with a costly perfume, seemingly spurning, uh, spurring, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Judas' determination to betray Jesus, two, Peter's denials, and three, Jesus' suffering as a direct fulfillment of prophecy. In Mark 14, 1 through 11, we see the priests and scribes willing to pay a considerable sum of money to arrest Jesus. Now, an unidentified woman, later identified as Mary, was willing to pay a much larger sum of money to anoint him. Finally, the disciples, apart from Judas Iscariot, fled when Jesus was arrested. The priests and rulers had been determined to arrest Jesus and kill him for about three years already, since at least the first cleansing of the temple. So, was that the first time that, that we have record that they wanted to kill him? Was as far as I know, temple? yeah. So three years have gone by. Yeah. And why did they want to kill him? He tried to change their paradigm. He seemed like a threat to them for some reason. Okay, Jim? Mark chapter 14, verses 1 to 11. It was now two days before the festival of Passover, Passover and unleavened bread. The priests and the teachers of the law were looking for a way to arrest Jesus secretly and to put him to death. We must do so. It was not. We must not do it during the festival, they said, or the people might riot. Jesus. Let's, let's interrupt for a second so that you don't have to just read a whole much. Charles, can you take the next paragraph there? But Jesus said, leave her alone. No, Why Jesus was in Bethany. Her? Okay. Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon, the uncle of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary, a man who had suffered from the dreaded skin disease. While Jesus was eating, a woman, Mary, came in with an alabaster jar full of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on Jesus' head. Some of the people there, Judas, became angry and said to one another, so to one another, what was the use of wasting the perfume? It could have been sold for more than 300 silver coins and money given to the poor, and they criticized her harshly. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a fine and beautiful thing for me. You will always have the poor with you. And any time you want to, you can help them. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body to prepare it ahead of time for burial. Wow. Now, I assure you that wherever the gospel is preached, 
all over the world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas... Well, go okay. ahead, Je Jennifer. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went off to the chief priests in order to betray Jesus to them. They were pleased to hear what he had to say, and they promised to give him money. So Judas started looking for a good chance to hand Jesus over to them. A good chance. Wow. <laughs> Judas had been upset by the even mild rebar rebuke of Jesus. While Judas was fomenting his plan to betray Jesus, and that had, he had been working on that for a while, Mary was pur purchasing her expensive perfume to be used in anointing the body of Jesus for his burial. And if we had time, we would go back and show you that, as we just put that information, is that Simon, who had been cured of leprosy, was the uncle of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And so probably at this feast that's going on, I'm guessing that it's very likely that Martha was in charge. And Lazarus, of course, was there because he'd been raised from the dead. So here's someone who'd been, been healed of leprosy, someone who'd been raised from the dead, and here's Jesus in the middle, and boy, this is a big occasion. But Mary was probably not invited mm -hmm. because of the incestuous... She was the black sheep, huh? She was the black sheep, with them in possession and what all of that. Anyway, Mark did not identify Mary as the woman who poured out the expensive perfume. That is likely because Mary was still alive when his gospel was written. Mm -hmm. About 30 years later, when John was writing, he identified Mary because she was already dead at that, by that time. We do not know exactly what motivated Mary to make that expensive gift, considering the fact that Jesus had not exposed her in front of her incestuous uncle. And there's the clue. Mm -hmm. And her friends and had cast seven different devils out of her. She obviously was very appreciative. And I'd like to just take a moment to read Acts 8, 1 to 3. And I'm sorry. It's it, Luke. It, it, it's Luke 8. Give me just a second here. We'll get that fixed. That's an error on my part. Sorry. Sometime later, Jesus travels to towns and villages preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The twelve disciples went with him, and so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out. Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Head's court, and Susanna and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. Imagine Jesus and a bunch of men traveling through the country with society women and formerly demon-possessed prostitutes. <laughs> It'd be quite the group. Yes. From the writings of Ellen White. The work of Mary was just the lesson the disciples needed to show them that the expression of their love for him would be pleasing to Christ. He had been everything to them, and they did not realize that soon they would be deprived of his presence, that soon they could offer him no token of their gratitude for his great love. The loneliness of Christ, separated from the heavenly courts, living the life of humility, was never understood humanity. of humanity, was never understood or appreciated by the disciples as it should have been. He was often grieved because his disciples did not give him that which he should have received from them. He knew that if they were under the influence of the heavenly angels that accompanied him, they would, they too would think no offering of sufficient value to declare the heart's spiritual affection. Okay, now I have to interrupt for a second under the influence of the heavenly angels that accompanied him, does that mean that we have that possibility as well? These were ordinary human beings, these disciples. Well, so, don't everybody speak up all at once. So heavenly beings, translated angels, mm -hmm. were with him, Jesus, mm -hmm. but they're also with us. Yes. Well, but he was, he was su suggesting something more than that. Anyway, go ahead. Their, their, their acknowledge gave... No, after knowledge. Yeah their, yeah, their after knowledge gave them a true sense of the many things that might have been done 
for Jesus, expressive of the love and gratitude of their hearts while they were near him. When Jesus was no longer with them and they felt indeed as sheep without a shepherd, they began to see how they might have shown him attentions that would have brought gladness to his heart. They no longer cast blame upon Mary, but upon themselves. Oh, if they could have taken back their censuring, their presenting the poor as more worthy of the gift than was Christ. Wow. They felt the reproof keenly as they took from the cross, the bruised body of their Lord. Uh, Myra, do you want to read the next one? The same want is evident in our world today, but few appreciate all that Christ is to them. If they did, the great love of Mary would be expressed. The anointing would be freely bestowed. The expensive ointment would not be called a waste. Nothing would be thought too costly to give for Christ. No self-denial, no self-sacrifice, too great to be endured for his sake. The words spoken in indignation, to what purpose is this waste, brought vividly before Christ the greatest sacrifice ever made. The gift of himself as the propitiation for the lost world. The Lord would have been, would be so bountiful in his human family that it would not be said of him that he could not, that he could, that do, he more. could do more. The gift of Jesus God gave all heaven. For the human point, from, from the human point of view, such a sacrifice was a wanton waste. To human reasoning, the whole plan of salvation is a waste of mercies and resources. Self-denial and wholehearted sacrifice meet us everywhere. Well may, be, well may the heavenly host look with amazement upon the human family who refuse to be lift, uplifted and enriched by the boundless love expressed in Christ. Well may they exclaim, why this great waste? Wow. From Desire yeah. of Ages, 565. Mm. Yeah. Mark, writing Peter's gospel, did not tell us what led Judas to do what he did. Writing many years later, <clears throat> excuse me, John once again spelled it out. John 12, 4 to 6. One of Jesus' disciples, Judas Iscariot, the one who was going to betray him, said, why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 silver coins? And we'll talk about how much money that was in a little bit. 300 silver coins and the money given to the poor. He said this not because he cared about the poor, because he was a thief. He carried the money bag, that's for the, all the, the whole group, Jesus and the disciples, and would help himself from it. Mm. You know, Mary, I just cannot help it. Mary was the only one who saw Christ in his real divine beauty before the cross. Mm -hmm. No one else. There's pretty good evidence to suggest that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were of the tribe of, well, Simon was a Pharisee, and they were relatives of his, so they were probably also Pharisees, and fairly well off. Mm. Well, anyway, the question now is, how did John know that about Judas? Did he know about it even as it was happening? Or did God reveal it to him later as he was writing his book? Yes. 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 <laughs> One or the other, huh? This side of the kingdom, it is impossible for us to know exactly how much Jesus knew in advance about the gift of Mary and the plot of Judas. But did John know that Mary had passed away uh, when he was writing? This is well, probably because, probably. see, this was, this was 60 years later that John was writing. 30 years. Hmm? 60, it's not 30 years later. 60, 60 years, years later. later. Mark was writing 30 years later, hmm. and, and she, Mary was probably still alive. Right, right, but right. 60 years later, Meth, Mary was, pro was probably dead. Yeah. Uh, that's a guess, but I'm not. Um, anyway. Jesus called her gift good and chastised those who rebuked her. In contrast, Judas had been looking for this good opportunity to betray Jesus. To betray Jesus. And he found one, didn't he? Hmm. 
these two sandwich stories give us a little idea of the lengths to which Satan was willing to go to try to lead men to oppose Jesus. Nevertheless, God worked through all of these deta those details to fill out the many, to fill out the story of Jesus' trials and crucifixion. And just mention real quickly what the, the Bible calls sand sandwich stories. There's part of a story and then something else is interrupted and then the, it's, the, the story is finished later. It's called a sandwich story. Okay, so Romans 8, 28, we know that in all things, God works for good with those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purpose. Notice that it is God who works for good, not all things, as suggested by the King James Version. Notice these comments about Judas and the disciples. From the Bible study guide, the characters in the third scene, as noted, are the disciples and Judas. Unlike the unnamed woman, they considered the perfume too costly to waste on Jesus. They insist that, quote, this perfume could have been sold from over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And now I'm just gonna stop for a second. What was the usual working, what, what was the usual wage for a working person for working a whole day? Wasn't it one silver coin? Yeah. Okay, and another one name denarii. for a silver coin, one denarius. So she gave a whole more than a year's salary for that perfume. We'll, we'll the talk. other thing is that it was not only Judas, it was many of the disciples who are saying this thing, oh, that's horrible. Though the money was not theirs to begin with, they nonetheless blamed and discredited the woman for bestowing the bounty on Jesus. Judas was willing to receive money to hand Jesus over to the others who plotted his death. Mark does not provide details about the negotiation of the price for Jesus' death. What we know of the negotiations we learned from Matthew's gospel. According to Matthew, Judas asked the priest, quote, what are you willing to give me to betray him to you? And they set out for him 30 pieces of silver. Okay, the expression 30 pieces of silver, also translated 30 silver shekels, comes from the Greek Triaconta Argyria. Each of these Argyria is equivalent to about four drachmas. So 30 times four is? 400. So the drachma was a basic standard Greek coin and it was equivalent in value to the Roman denarius. It is likely this is the coin in which Judas received his 30 pieces of silver or 120 denarii. So how much did she pay for the perfume? 300. 300. And how much did they pay for Jesus? 120. The amount paid by the priest and accepted by Judas was inferior in relation to the amount paid by the woman for the perfume. In short, a lone woman paid approximately 300 denarii to anoint Jesus with perfume as a, mon as a memorial, while Judas accepted only 120 denarii to betray him. The discrepancy speaks volumes. It shows how little Judas and those who sympathized with his view valued their master. What you read earlier from Luke 8, mm -hmm. Mary traveled with the disciples at least mm -hmm. part of the time. So they knew her. Yes. <clears throat> they knew her. This was not a, an unknown person. They, no. they knew she was wealthy. They, they probably knew a lot about her. A they former, probably despised uh, her. A former yeah. prostitute, yeah. yeah, really, woman from whom seven demons have been cast out, and wealthy. That's quite a combination, isn't it? Mm. And the sister of the man who was raised from the uh, of yeah. a man who was raised from the dead. Yep. Okay, Mark fourteen. Who's next? I think that's me. Was it Jim? No, it's Jim, I guess. Mark fourteen twelve. On the day, excuse me, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread. The day the lamb for the Passover meal was killed, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and get the Passover meal ready for you? Okay. So now what's, it is interesting to note that Jesus sent two of his disciples, Peter and John, to prepare the Passover supper for the group. Normally that would be preparing a lamb for them to eat, along with bitter herbs. What happened to the lamb and the bitter herbs? The Passover was a memorial of what happened as the children of Israel were leaving Egypt. 
what, what we note instead is that Jesus introduced a new kind of ceremony which they, were, they ate unleavened bread and drank unfermented wine. This meal is known as the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper and probably took place in the upper room which likely belonged to Mark's mother and which became a popular meeting place for the disciples after the resurrection. It is striking that the Lord's Supper, which Jesus institutes here, no use is made of the lamb of the Passover meal. That is because Jesus is the Lamb of God, compared with John chapter 1, verse 29. The bread of our Lord's Supper represents His body. The new covenant is sealed with the blood of Jesus, and the cup represents this. He says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Okay, so we have no idea what happened to the lamb and the bitter herbs. Try to imagine the thoughts of Jesus as he's sitting there. Just th think about this now. He's sitting there, hearing Peter vehemently deny that he would ever forsake Jesus, and he knows what is going to happen. And at the same time, recognize that Judas, who's sitting right next to him, was about to betray him. Or had already betrayed him and was about well, to execute that yeah. betrayal. Wow, with all the ideas about Peter's denial and Judas' betrayal running through his mind, he also recognized that when it would come to the critical moments, his disciples would be sleeping, mm. and then they would all run away from him. Mm -hmm. And Mark himself running away naked. We'll talk about that in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Jesus thought back to Zechariah 13, 7? Jennifer? Zechariah 13, 7, the Lord Almighty says, Wake up, sword, and attack the shepherd who works for me. Kill him, and the sheep will be scattered. I will attack my people. Good news, Bible. There are a lot of prophecies in Zechariah. Did Jesus, was Jesus aware of that one? We must give some leeway to the disciples. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to be a little kind to them, to the disciples thinking, I think it would be hard for me even to sleep at night if in their situation, trying to work out the incredibly conflicting ideas running through their heads. On one hand, they knew about the people who had celebrated at the triumphal entry and were prepared to crown Jesus as king. On the other hand, they had heard Jesus tell them several times that he was going to be betrayed into the hands of Gentiles and be killed. How do you, I mean, how do you calculate that? Didn't Peter even rebuke him once? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. After having finished the Lord's Supper and after Judas left the group, remember Jesus said, what you, need, what you have to do, do quickly. Jesus led the rest of the disciples out of the upper room and down across the valley to the Garden of Gethsemane. We do not know exactly where the Garden of Gethsemane was located. They will show it to you, but it's not really true. We don't really know for sure. Because at the time of the Roman siege of Jerusalem in AD 70, the Romans cut down all the trees on the Mount of Olives. Mm -hmm. What we do know is that the name Gethsemane means oil press. So presumably olives from the, that garden and perhaps other places were pressed into oil nearby. Mark 14, 32 to 34, they came to a place called Gethsemane and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James and John with him. Distress and anguish came over him and he said to them, the sorrow in my heart is so great that it almost crushes me Stay here and keep watch from the Good News Bible. What, 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 were, what was going on in their minds when he said that? Ellen White says he, he, he even struggled to walk on that trip to Gethsemane and some, they had to stop and, and well not stop, but sort of balance him because of all the things that are going on in his head. I'm sure we don't have even the faintest idea. Well, Bible study guide says, as Jesus enters the garden, he leaves the disciples there and goes further with Peter, James, and John. But then he leaves these three as well and proceeds further by himself. The spatial distancing 
suggest Jesus is becoming more isolated as he faces the upcoming suffering. Okay, that's from our Bible study guide. Is it possible that Jesus did not want his disciples to see all that he was going through? Mm. I'm not sure that they would have understood any better. Well, Mark 14, 35 to 42, we're going to see what Mark says about that. He went a little farther on, threw himself on the ground and prayed that if possible, he might not have to go through that time of suffering. Father, he prayed, my father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup of suffering away from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Now, remember, this is somebody who has spent his nights, every night of his at least his adult life for sure, talking to his father. Then he returned and found the three disciples asleep. He said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Weren't you able to stay awake even one hour for one hour? And he said to them, keep watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away once more and prayed, saying the same words. Then he came back to the disciples and found them asleep again. They could not keep their eyes open and they did not know what to say to him. When he came back the third time, he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is now being handed over to the power of sinners. Get up. Let us go. Look, here is the man who is betraying me. Mm. Mm. Jim? I guess... Is it my turn? Yeah. From the Bible study guide, Jesus prays for the cup of suffering to be removed, but only if it is God's will, Mark 14, 36. He uses the Aramaic term Abba, which Mark translates as Father. The term that not, does the not term mean. does not mean Daddy, as some have suggested. The term used by a child to address his father was Abi, see Raymond D. Brown, The Death of Messiah, Anchor Bible. However, the use of the term Abba Father does carry the close familial linkage, which should not be diminished from the Bible study guide. So, you know, he's speaking to Father now as an adult and not as a baby. Do you think the disciples were just sleepy? Mm -hmm. Or did the devil have something to do with their sleepiness at that critical time for Jesus when they could have been supporting him? Mm. Anybody want to speculate? Maybe Satan was at work too. I think the devil was at yes. work. I think the Works devil realized time. that this was his, fi his final hurrah. We do not know exactly how long Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. However, we do know what happened next. And here's something that was not mentioned in our Bible study guide, which I think is absolutely essential for us. Having made the decision to accept the Father's will, he fell dying to the ground from which he had partially risen. Okay, so let's talk about this. He is now, this is a healthy young man. He's 33. He falls dying to the ground. What is going on here? His pain in his heart is obviously stronger than the... It weakens him. Well, he's going to die a little while, well, the next day. And what's he going to die of? Separation from Broken God. Heart. Separation from his father. And what's happening here? This stage is being beginning of it. Stage is there. This is the first of two deaths that Jesus is going to demonstrate. This death, the entire universe saw. Not a single human being saw it. But this death, the entire, the entire universe saw, and they saw it, if you, you can go back and, and, and think about this through, this was a, God wanted the universe to see that if he separates himself from Je even Jesus as a human being, he would die. And the universe saw that, but no human being saw it. They had no, we had no idea. So carry on, read. 
But now were his disciples to place their hands tenderly beneath the head of their faithful master and bathe that brow marred indeed more than the sons of men. The Savior trod the winepress alone and of the people there was none with him. But God suffered with his son. Angels beheld the Savior's agony. They saw their Lord enclosed by the legions of satanic forces. Okay, wow. hold on just a second now. He is being s surrounded by satanic legions of satanic forces. Do you think that separates him from the Father? The satanic forces are certainly trying. They are certainly trying. So here, here there's a massive war going on between God's forces and the devil's forces in the Garden of Gethsemane, which most people know nothing about. Okay? His nature weighed down with a shuddering, mysterious dread. There was silence in heaven. No harp was touched. Could mortals have viewed the amazement of the angelic host as his silent grief they watched the Father separating his beams of light, love, and glory from his beloved Son, they would better understand how offensive in his sight sin is. So Jesus is dying here of the second death. He's dying the second death right here in the Garden of Gethsemane. And no human being has touched him yet. Okay? Read on. Jennifer. Yeah, go ahead, Jennifer. Um, the world's unfallen and the heavenly angels had watched with intense interest as the conflict drew to its close. Satan and his confederacy of evil, the legions of apostasy, watched intently this great crisis in the work of redemption. Mm. The powers of good and evil waited to see what answer would come to Christ's thrice repeated prayer. Angels had longed to bring relief to the divine sufferer, but this might not be. No way of escape was found for the Son of God. In this awful crisis, when everything was at stake, when the mysterious cup trembled in the hand of the sufferer, the heavens opened, a light shine, shone forth amid the stormy darkness of the crisis hour, and the mighty angel who stands in God's presence occupying the position from which Satan fell, came to the side of the Christ. Now, I'm going to have to interrupt for a second. Here's Gabriel, mm -hmm. who took Lucifer's place in direct conflict with Lucifer, now Satan. Okay? One angel, and he's surrounded by the legions of Satan. Okay? And what happens? The angel came not to take the cup from Christ's hand, but to strengthen him to drink it with the assurance of the Father's love. Wow. From Luke 22, yeah. verse 43 to 44, he came to give power to the divine human suppliant. He pointed him to the open heavens, telling him of the souls that would be saved as the result of his sufferings. He assured him that his Father is greater and more powerful than Satan that his death would result in the utter discomfiture of Satan, and that the kingdom of this world would be given to the saints of the Most High. He told him that he would see of the, tri of the travail of his soul and be satisfied, for he would see a multitude of the human race saved, eternally saved. Wow. Desire of ages. So Jesus now from this point on to everything he's gonna suffer, has to say, okay, do I believe what the angel told me about my father? Mm -hmm. If you believe it, you can survive it. That's an incredible, incredible statement. Mm -hmm. Jesus would have died in the Garden of Gethsemane if God had not sent an angel to strengthen him. But he needed to live through all of the rest of the events of that weekend so that we, as humans, could understand at least a portion of what God was willing to do to demonstrate the truth about the second death 
and the awfulness of sin. Just imagine how the world's, the words of that angel must have given him some hope to all that happened to him. The truth about the second death being a direct result of sin, separating us from God, the only source of life, was demonstrated right there in the Garden of Gethsemane. But no human being had any idea of what had happened. If Jesus had died there in the Garden, we would have assumed that he had died from a stroke or perhaps a heart attack. So the angel strengthened him so that he would die in a place and way that humans could see and possibly understand. And wow. yet most of us still don't understand. Most of us still don't understand. Well, and what they do, most people are peddle the idea that Jesus died to pay the penalty for your sins, yeah. and the law is nailed. Excuse me, the law is nailed to the cross. So Jesus did it all. They say, and yeah. <laughs> that's where the thinking stops. Yep. <laughs> okay, Gordon. Mark fourteen forty three to onward. Jesus was still speaking when Judas, one of the twelve disciples, arrived. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs and sent by the chief priest, the teachers of the law and the elders. The traitor had given the crowd a signal. The man I kiss is the one you want. Arrest him and take him away under guard. Myra, why don't you pick a, take the next paragraph there. As soon as Judas arrived, he went up to Jesus and said, teacher, and kissed him. Hmm. So they arrested Jesus and held him tight. But one of those standing there drew his sword and struck at the high priest's slave, cutting off his ear. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Do you think he was trying to cut off his ear? <laughs> no. He missed the neck. <laughs> Maybe the, yeah. But hadn't Jesus told him to take, take somebody says, oh, we, we got one, we got you? one. So Jesus had the opportunity to, right in front of those people that were arresting him, to see his display yes, yes. that mm -hmm. they'd probably not seen anywhere else yeah. prior because he was doing most of the stuff out around other places. He wasn't doing it right there near in Jerusalem. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Um, Cutting off the ear. Cutting off his ear. Verse 48. And Jesus spoke up and said to them, did you, have, did you have to come with swords and clubs to capture me as though I were an outlaw? Day after day, <laughs> uh -huh. I was with you teaching in the temple, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must come true. Good so time. your evil deeds were predicted in advance. Yeah. <laughs> we are admonished to pray as Jesus did. Matthew 6, 10, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <clears throat> the disciples all fled as Jesus was arrested. Was Mark there also? Here's a couple of verses, Jim. Mark chapter 14, verses 50 to 52. Then the disciples left him. And all ran, the disciples. All the disciples left him and ran away. Certain young woman, young man. young man dressed only in a linen cloth was following Jesus. They tried to arrest him, but he ran away naked, leaving the cloth behind. Good news Bible. So how the did, Bible's- How did Mark know that? Huh? <laughs> how did Mark know how that? How did Mark? Okay. Charles? Ellen White, Judas has naturally a strong love no, for money. Back up a little bit. No, no. Back up. Disciples. Oh, okay. Bible, Bible yes. The disciples, all three, including Peter, who nevertheless will appear, reappear, following Jesus at a distance and uh, ending up getting himself in trouble. But Mark 14, 51, and 52 tells of a young man following Jesus, an account found here and nowhere else in the canonical gospels, something that it was Mark himself, but that is unprovable. What is remarkable is that he runs away naked. The young man, instead of leaving all to follow Jesus, leaves all to flee from Jesus. <laughs> Interesting play on words there. Yeah. <laughs> it's incredible to consider what Judas did. Or Ellen Melanie, White's words? Or Melanie G. White, Judas had naturally a strong love for money, but he had not always been corrupt enough to do such a deed as this. He had fostered the evil spirit of avarice until it had become the ruling motive of his life. 
the love of mammon overbalanced his love for Christ. Through becoming the slave of one vice, he gave himself to Satan to be driven to any lengths in sin from the desire of ages. Now, just think about this. Here's a man who has begged to be allowed to be a part of the 12 disciples. Mm -hmm. and, Jesus, and Jesus accepted him. And there he's working with him. He's working side by side, Jesus. Every, he's carrying the money bag. So Jesus is, you know, constantly talking to him, do this, do that, what this, and so, whatever like this. And yet his love for money overbalances all that influence from Christ. Okay, Gordon? From the Bible study guide, think about the fearful idea that being a slave of one, oh, only one vice led Jesus to do what he, Not, Judas to do what yeah, he did. Please. Not Jesus. <laughs> uh, what should this tell us about hating sin and by God's grace overcoming it from the Bible study guide? It is one thing to betray someone behind their back, but Jesus did it in the Jesus. face of Jesus pretending to be his friend. Wow. Mrs. White says, Judas reasoned that if Jesus was to be crucified, the event must come to pass. His own act of betraying the Savior would not change the result. If Jesus was not to die, it would only force him to deliver himself. At all events, Judas would gain something by his treachery. He counted that he was, he had made a sharp bargain in betraying his Lord. Now let's back up a little bit and look at this. Judas apparently was the only one of the disciples that realized what Jesus said about dying. Yeah. And he went to the priests and said, you know, he negotiated with them because he, he had this thing in mind. He said, if he's going to die, I might as well make a profit out of it. But then he knew how much power Jesus had, so he, I'm sure he didn't believe Jesus was going to allow himself to be killed. Yes. He was it, going to force Jesus to yeah. show I, himself. I think Ellen White suggests that Judas thought, I'm going to be the one that's going to force Jesus to become the king of the, of exactly. the nation. And I'm going to be given the credit for this. Yes. I'm the kingmaker. Yeah. Mm. Incredible. We will not know until we get into the kingdom of heaven exactly the sequence of events that occurred in that garden. When Judas arrived at the garden ahead of that mob of priests and elders and rabble from the streets and Judas kissed Jesus, absolute chaos reigned. And I mean, and you think about it, there was probably only one gate to the garden. So this rabble, who have they passed by already? Um, the other eight disciples. Yeah, right. They were sleeping outside the gate, right? Yeah. Or somewhere close to the gate. And Jesus had taken his other three disciples further on. We don't even ask about them. Where were they as all these people came? They, they, them they, to sleep. <laughs> they were probably awakened by the noise and what? Yeah. And, and ran. This day, yeah. run. Yes. Run, guys, run. <laughs> Get out of here. Yeah. Well, when Judas arrived at the gate ahead of that, I'm sorry, um, Peter tried to kill one of the servants of the high priest by swinging his sword. Peter managed to cut off the man's ear. Jesus promptly healed the man and the ear. Later at his trial, Jesus reminded the priest that he had been quietly teaching the temple grounds day after day, and they had failed to arrest him at any of those times. I mean, did they, were they even a little bit embarrassed? No, they, I'm sure they were so focused on their, that they finally had him. They, they were scared of the multitude of the, yes, people, of the people when he was in the temple. He yeah. was, he was their leader there. He was the people's leader, the people's friend. Mm -hmm. And they were afraid to go against him, against the people and, and arrest him. And if you remember, they even sent the, the guards to arrest him. And what happened? The guards no came one, back and said, no man, one spoke like this. no one's ever spoken like this guy. <laughs> and the priests themselves, that we read, yeah. read earlier, 
they said, we can't do it at the festival because yeah. there will be a riot yeah. if we arrest him then. Millions of people, literally, yeah. crammed into the temple. Hmm. Well, despite carrying out illegal trials at night, it was against the law for them to try somebody at night. And in the morning again, they had to repeat to make it legal. And despite incredible abuse by soldiers and people, the priests could not make any progress in the trial of Jesus. So where did they take him? From the garden, they took him where? First of all, to, to Annas. No, first of all, to Caiaphas, I think. And then to Annas. Right, then to Annas. Yeah. Okay, uh, it's my turn. Mark 14, 60 to 65, the high priest stood up in front of them. So the, the high priest at this time was Caiaphas, stood up in front of them all and questioned Jesus. Have you no answer to the accusations they bring against you? And of course, we know that they made all sorts of accusations and they conflicted with each other and no two of them could agree. And they've been through this whole process. And so finally he says, have you no answer to these accusations they bring against you? And of course, why are all these people here lined up to accuse Jesus? They've been bribed, I'm sure. This is the same Caiaphas only a few days earlier said, it is expedient for one person to die for the nation, that the yes. whole nation. This is just a few days earlier. But Jesus kept quiet and would not say a word. Again, the high priest questioned him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed God? Hmm. I am, answered Jesus. And you will see the Son of God seated on the right of the Almighty and coming with the clouds of heaven. And I'm going to take, I, we've got an extra minute or two to remind you what it says in John chapter 8. What did, Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin. He testified before them about the healing of that, uh, that man who was born blind. And three times he said, what to them? I am. Yeah. I am. I am. And finally he says, you guys don't get it, do you? I mean, this is the same people we're talking about here. He finally says, before Abraham was, I am. Oh, that's what you mean. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> just amazing. Uh, I am, answered Jesus, same story right here. Finally he says, right to his face. Was, he'd said right to his face before, but... And you will see, you will all see the Son of Man seated on the right of the Almighty and coming with the clouds of heaven. And where does that come from? The book of Daniel, chapter 7. The high priest tore his clothes and said, We don't need any more witnesses. You hear, you heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? I mean, they profess to believe that when the Messiah comes, it's exactly what he's going to do. So here's a man who's performed all these miracles, who's come speaking to them, and, oh, this is blasphemy. But he did not come as King David. If he did, there would not be this problem. What is your decision, the high priest says. They all voted against him. He was guilty and should be put to death. Some of them began to spit on Jesus. By the way, there were a couple of people who were not there, of the members of the Sanhedrin. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Yeah. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. They were not invited. And why were they not invited? Because they spoke. They're questionable. They already, uh, they're questionable behavior. Yeah, yeah. Maybe <laughs> this, guy, this guy can't be relied on. Well, some of them began to spit on Jesus mm -hmm. and they blindfolded him and hit him. Guess who hit you, they said, and the guards took him and slapped him. Mm. As the trial progressed, Peter was confronted in the courtyard by the servant gore, girl. So we've got, another, this is the other, the second half of the Peter story, isn't it? Mm. Jesus had warned, had told Peter, you'll be, betray me three times. So what's happening now, Jim? I think that's, isn't it? I think you're next. Mark, Mark 14, verses 66 to 72. Peter was still down in, the courtyard when one of the high priest's servants women came by when she saw peter warming himself she looked straight at him and said do you too were with jesus of nazareth but he denied it i don't know i don't understand what you are talking about he answered 
and went out into the passage. Just then the cock crowed. The servant woman saw him there and again, excuse me, and began to repeat to the passengers by, he is one of them. But Peter denied it again. A little while later, the bystander accused Peter again. You can't deny that you were one of them because you too are from Galilee. Then Peter said, I swear that I am telling the truth. May God punish me if I am not. I do not know the man you are talking about. This is our first pulp, right? Just, <laughs> <laughs> just then the cock crowed a second time and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, before the cock crows twice, crows twice, you will say three times that I do not know, that you do not know me. And he broke down and cried. Good news, Bible. And Ellen White, of course, says, what? Well, we'll talk about that in just a moment. What a contrast between Jesus' response to the beatings and the accusations at his trial versus Peter's response to the questions of the maiden, the servant woman. Ellen uh, White comments. Ellen White, while the degrading oaths were fresh upon Peter's lips and the shrill crowing, crowing of the cock was still ringing in his ears, the Savior turned from the frowning judges and looked full upon his poor disciple. At the same time, Peter's eyes were drawn to his master. In that general countenance, he read deep pity and sorrow, but there was no anger there. The sight of that pale, suffering face, those quivering lips, and the look of the compassion and forgiveness pierced his heart like an arrow. Conscience was aroused. Memory was active. Peter called to his mind his promise of a few short hours before that he would go with his Lord to the prison and to death. He remembered his grief when the Savior told him in the upper chamber that he would deny his Lord thrice the same night. Peter had just declared that he knew not God, Jesus but now realized the bitter grief, how well his Lord knew him, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and how accurately he had read his heart, the falseness of which was unknown ever to him himself. Desire of Ages, Ellen White, 712 and 713. Mm. Finally, the high priest arises and addresses Jesus directly. At first, Jesus does not respond, but then the high priest places him under oath before God and asks the direct question, if he is the Messiah. And I was supposed, this is supposed to be yours, Jennifer. You want to pick it up there? <laughs> Jesus frankly and openly admits that he is and then references Daniel 7, 13, 14, regarding the Son of Man as seated at God's right hand and coming with the clouds of heaven. This is too much for the high priest who tears his robes and calls for Jesus' condemnation, which the council immediately gives. The leaders begin to shame Jesus by spitting on him, covering his face, beating him, hmm. and calling on him to prophecy. From the Bible wow. study guide. Mm -hmm. from the Bible. Judas begged Jesus to deliver himself from his enemies. Now we come back to Judas. From Ellen White. Judas now cast himself at the feet of Jesus, acknowledging him to be the Son of God and entreating him to deliver himself. The Savior... So the story is not working out quite like Judas was hoping, yeah. right? Mm. The Savior did not reproach his betrayer. He knew that Judas did not repent. His confession was forced from his guilty soul by an awful sense of condemnation and a looking for of judgment but he felt no deep, heartbreaking grief that he had betrayed the spotless Son of God and denied the Holy One of Israel. Yet Jesus spoke no word of condemnation. He looked pityingly upon Judas and said, for this hour came I into the world, from Desire of Ages 722. Okay, now we've just had mention of two times. Jesus looked at Peter and what was the effect? He repented. He, was, he, he repented and ran out and wept, broken, bro crying, mm -hmm. ran out and collapsed in the Garden of Gethsemane, right where Jesus had had 
about himself. Now, Jesus looks straight at Judas, and what kind of response does he get? No repentance. Set in his ways. If you could have asked Jesus right at that point in time why he had to die, what do you think he would have said? Why didn't he t directly tell us? There's no text that says, explains why he had to die. Well, not tell me. The only place where someone tries to do that is Paul in Romans 3. John 18, 37, when he's yeah. explained why, when he's talking to Pilate, why he was born. Yeah. And that is to uh, bear witness to the truth. But also in, I think it's uh, John 6, or is it 8, 39, something like that. Uh, um, yeah. Let us review briefly events that happened involving Peter during those two days. First, he was sent with John to prepare the Passover meal. During the Lord's Supper, he vehemently denied Jesus' accusations that he would deny Jesus three times. He fell asleep with James and John in the garden. He could not stay awake to help Jesus. He tried to kill the servant with his sword and <laughs> the mob arrested Jesus. He followed Jesus at a distance, trying to determine what was going to happen. Um, then he denied Jesus three times, just as Jesus had predicted. And finally, seeing that look from the Savior in the courtyard, Peter ran out and stumbled back to the Garden of Gethsemane and fell in the very place where Jesus had prayed. Peter wished that he could die. Mm. Think of the thoughts that were going through the mind of Jesus at that point, realizing that his disciples, some of whom had been with him for three and a half years, still did not seem to have any idea of what, he was, what he had really came to accomplish. But Jesus knew what was coming and the truth of what sin did to him and will do to the wicked in the end. So many, th uh, so many things were happening in such a short time. No doubt those with the most important events in the history of our world, those, uh, those were the most important events in the history of our world so far. What can we learn from studying them more closely? And we're told that there will be at the end a panorama. Everybody who has ever lived will see that panorama. And this will be one of the main scenes, I'm absolutely certain. There it is. Everybody gets to see it with their own eyes. Wow, it's hard to imagine. And of course, to see the events that came before it and the events that come after, came after it. Anyway, it's time to pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for the blessings of these lessons the words that you have given us to think and to understand, to realize the incredible conflicts that are going on back and forth and up and down in, in these last few days of Jesus' life. Help us to get the messages and to understand them as we should, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.